brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A'udhu billahi minash shaitan rajeem. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah al-Qa'il. Laqad kana lakum fi Rasulillahi uswatun hasnatun liman kanu yarju Allah wa yawmul akhir wa dhakru Allah kathira. Walhamdulillah al-Qa'il. Inna Allah wa malaikatuhu yusalluna ala al-Nabi. Ya ayyuha aladhina amanu sallu alayhi wa sallamu taslima. وأفضل صلاة وأتم تسليم على نبينا وأسواتنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه والتابعين لهم بخير وإسان إلى يوم الدين وعلينا معهم وفيهم برحمةك يا أحمد الرحيمين وعما بعد. First of all, brothers and sisters, it's my honor and my privilege to be here with you in this. Uh, very important and well-known masjid uh, in our American Muslim community. And I ask Almighty Allah to preserve this community and preserve you, your family members, and all those who you love. What I will be doing briefly in this talk is giving a little introduction or a taste <clears throat> to my latest book that was released um, about a month and a half ago. And it is entitled Futua and Raising Males into Sacred Manhood. Futua and Raising Males into Sacred Manhood. And before defining uh, the term Futua, I will go into the uh, occasion of why uh, I felt the need uh, to write this book. Uh, firstly, uh, before writing this book, we saw a need in the city of Detroit in particular, uh, not just myself, but some other uh, imams and elders saw certain needs in the community. And also we were approached by uh, a number of mothers, single mothers in particular, and also sisters who were looking to get married. And there were some common concerns, and some common things that were articulated in relationship to our young males in Metro Detroit. And I think this is kind of a microcosm of a macrocosm. Because if you know anything about Metro Detroit, the Detroit Dearborn community, it is the most concentrated metropolitan area of Muslims per capita in America. Right? We have 300,000 Muslims in this area. And Detroit doesn't even, as a city, doesn't even have a million people. Right, we have three. We even have a township, Hamtramck, which is the only Muslim majority town in America with a Muslim mayor and all Muslim city council. Right, so we live in an area that's very Muslim, and if we have these issues in an area that's very Muslim, then we are safe to say in some areas such as perhaps Little Rock, Arkansas, or, Sa or Salt Lake City, Utah, for instance, in which the Muslim communities are minuscule in comparison to ours then perhaps this is an issue that Muslims are facing uh, throughout America, and we could say even throughout North America. So what we saw that then guided us to establishing some programming in the city of Detroit was, a com was, it, was some common things. Number one, the erosion of traditional healthy masculinity in society in general in which Muslims are copying uh, a type of um, non-masculine, uh, effeminate type of expression, right? So this is one thing which plays itself out in certain ways. So we have, we have extremes to the right and to the left, right? So ar-rajula, or sacred manhood, is in the wasat, right? This is in the middle. Anything too far to the right or too far to the left, we say that's not healthy or sacred manhood, right? Because we believe in the middle ground, right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about us, we're supposed to be in the middle. We're the middle balance ummah. Right? And the best of matters are those that are in the middle. So we are aiming for the wasat. What's too far to the right? Brutish, 
tyrannical, bully type of behavior, we wouldn't say that's true masculinity, right? I don't even believe in that term toxic masculinity. I don't even think we should be using it. This is, we should not be using the nomenclature of critical theory and the social sciences based in kufr. I don't believe in this at all, right? This is part of the problem of the, the, the program of trying to emasculate manhood, right? And then, of course, there's no term toxic femininity. It's only toxic masculinity, right? That's one extreme. Then the other extreme is what we've found more amongst a lot of our younger males, which is a type of young male who lacks initiative, who delays taking responsibility, who doesn't stand up and show moral courage when it's time to show moral courage. This is the weak, emasculated male. And this is a growing phenomenon that we've seen throughout American society. And actually, there's been some American social scientists that have been bold enough to write about this. This was written about, about a decade ago by uh, Dr. Leonard Sachs. He wrote a book called Boys Adrift, right, where this was noticed in the United States and Canada. There's another book that's called Coddling of the American Mind that talks about this issue in general of delayed adolescence, in which those things that are expected from young males traditional, or young men traditional, not just universally, but in American society, now those expectations have been delayed to the detriment of society as a whole, and which has negatively affected, which includes affected our women folk in a negative way, right? So these are, these are some underlying issues. So what we did in the city of Detroit, we established uh, the uh, Fatua Halaka that we would have one day a week. A group of brothers got together. Sheikh Abdul Karim Yahya is one of them. Sheikh uh, Ibrahim Kafani Sise is another one. Uh, I'm one of those people that group. We organized a series of programming to try to give some traditional healthy structure. And we pattern this off of the traditional Fatua and the Fatua guilds that were established during the time of the Abbasiyin, which I will get to, and it was later carried over to the Seljuks and then to the Ottomans, and it was adopted in areas in various degrees in, 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 Af in the African continent, right? Of systematized Quran and Sunnah based rearing of males into sacred manhood. Now the term el Futua, and there's been several books written about this topic over the years, right? This is, this is not a uh, new genre, we could say. Uh, es Sulami wrote the first book called Kitab el Futua. Sheikh Abdul Qadir el Jilani al Hanbali wrote a treatise called Kitab el Futua. There have been other books written with this title. Ibn al Mi'mar al Hanbali wrote a book called Kitab al Fatua. And in other books, other scholars had Bab al Fatua in their books, such as Madaris al Salikin, but Ibn Qayyim al Jawziya al Hanbali wrote chapters talking about al Fatua. The origin of this term in an Islamic civilization, we aren't 100% sure of. We, there are reports of a hadith that lack asanid, they lack chains of transmission, in which this word is used. There are athar, or sayings attributed to al Khalifa al Rashid Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu an that use this term. But when we begin to see this in discourse and later books, we see people quote it in sources regularly, is that this term began to be deployed, we can say around the time of the third generation, and we have people such as Imam Jafar al-Sadiq and Imam Ahmed ibn Hanbal, 
who use these terms fatua. And this fatua, as a tradition, was something that was practiced not to the fullest extent by the Arabs in the time of El Jahiliya. So now, what is El Fatua? And how does this relate to us trying to do better in systematizing raising our young males into sacred manhood? So we know the word El Fatua, linguistically, Lugowi speaking, is related to the word Fatah, it's a youth. El Fityan, a conglomeration of youth that puts us in the mind of transitioning from one stage to another. So the Fatah is now a little boy. The Fatah, or those amongst the Fityan, would be little, uh, th th they are leaving the age of adolescence, coming into a stage of greater maturity, according to the sacred law, but also greater societal responsibility. So one that would be mukallif, we could say, according to the sacred law. But also there's more expected from the, the, the young males of Fatua in which they are no longer treated like little boys in society. They are then given manly responsibilities. So for instance, Abdullah ibn Umar, for instance, was mukallif, and at the age of 15, the Prophet وسلم, allowed him to go out al jihad fi sabilah. He's 15 years old. Usama ibn Zayd ibn Haritha anhuma, was allowed to go out al fi sabilah, and the Prophet وسلم, actually appointed him at the very end of his, last, uh, of his life to be the last commander. What? As a teenager. Right? There was an expectation and responsibility was b bestowed, and they weren't treated like boys, and they rose to the occasion of acting responsibly like men. They weren't treated like uh, just foolish um, uh, uh, um, boys that, that, that could take on no responsibility, right? There's some, there were some expectations that were set, and they rose to the occasion. Even the word fatwa or el fatawa is even related linguistically to the word fatua. Now, operationally speaking, el fatua is sometimes translated as Islamic chivalry, sometimes sacred chivalry. El fatua is a code of honor. It is a code of conduct in which the Fithyan have certain virtues that they strive to manifest this inward reality outwardly. As our beloved Prophet said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, in a hadith that is considered well authenticated. When I say well authenticated, I mean hadith hasan. A vigorously authenticated hadith would be hadith sahih. Hadith hasan narrated by Imam Tabarani and others. Inna li kulli shay'in haqiqa. Right, for, it starts off, for everything, there is a deeper reality. For all physical manifestations, there are metaphysical realities behind those physical manifestations. What comes out is a manifestation of what is in the inside. Like Imam Ashafi, shafii in a poem where he talks about this issue of lisan al-maqal and lisan al-hal, that we have a speech that is verbal of the tongue, and then we have a speech of the inward state. And know that which is inside will eventually manifest and come out. And it'll come out. So this is a code of honor, and these are virtues. And all those, these virtues are not, and this arrojula is not only for males, females can display most of these traits, at least to a degree. But we don't believe, we shouldn't believe, and this is another trick of, of, of Western academia and society, men and women aren't equal in everything. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave certain fada'il to women over men in certain things, starting with the sharia, the sacred law. There's certain rights and privileges that women have in the sacred law that men don't have. Men can't ask for a mahar, for instance. Right? Men cannot ask for that. Likewise, certain fada'il have been given to men over women. And not just outwardly, also inwardly. And men and women are only equal, as I was taught by my, my Sheikh, Sheikh Ali, Suleiman Ali, Hafizullah Ta'ala. Men and women have equality in what? In El Insaniya and with the Wab, Wal Iqab. Right, that's it. In our basic humanity, we're equal. In our ability in our taqwa to be rewarded or punished by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we are equal. We are not equal physically. We're not equal in, in DNA. We are not equal or exactly the same in brain structure. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the dhakr and the untha, and there is balance or mizan in the creation, not only with the male and female, but the masculine and feminine traits that are in creation. Even in the Arabic language, there's gender applied to things. There isn't a, a thing that we say called neuter, even in language of Quran, like it. Things have gender assigned to them, right? So there's wisdom in us understanding things that when we're talking about certain view, virtues that we want to see our menfolk display. That the measure of womanhood is not to copy men and everything to be like a man. And likewise, everything that women do, it should not be the objective in order to not have toxic masculinity for men to copy the ways to act like socially just as women do. That, that shouldn't be our, that shouldn't be the maqsa, that shouldn't be the goal. Right? So is a code of honor, and there are certain uh, maqamat in regards to this to get to the fullness of striving to display this Islamic or sacred chivalry that the men are supposed to display. And notice what I'm saying from sacred manhood. All men are males. But all males aren't men. And I don't mean just reaching puberty. I mean, hakikaten, all males are not men. Because in order to be a rajal, there is an inward state of being a rajal hakiki, a real man, than just being outwardly with lihya and a deep voice, and maybe you bench press 300 pounds. That doesn't in and of itself make someone a man. Right? So there's a certain level, and there's different steps in regards to this. Now, and these different steps are raising males in the secret manhood. This was systematized during one of the sultans, during the time of the Abbasiyin. So we know we have the righteous khulafa. Right? We have the khulafa according to the prophetic style. We have, of course, the khilafa of Abu Bakr Siddiq, wa Umar ibn Khattab, wa Uthman ibn Nafan, wa Ali ibn Abi Talib, wa Hassan ibn Ali. After that, in those 30 years, then we have the rule of Bani Umayyah. Right? And then, outwardly, according to the sacred law, we have the Sahabi Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. And then after that, it starts going downhill for the most part, right? Then after Beni Omeya leaves power, then we have what are called the Abbasiyin, Beni Abbas, the descendants of Al Abbas Amr Rasulillah sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wasallam. And one of the effective, and I'm not saying he was perfect. I mean, he put Ibn uh, uh, he put Ibn Al Jalzi or Hanbali rahimullah taala in jail unjustly, right? And this was the fate of many of our early scholars. 
If they said something that the political authorities didn't like, they put them in prison. Abu Hanifa was put in prison. Imam Malik was put in prison. Imam Shafi was dragged in chains from Yemen to Baghdad. Imam Ahmed was put in prison. Right? All of the, except for what Imam Siraj will have says, scholars for dollars. Scholars for dollars don't go to prison. They, they, they get maybe a fleet of Mercedes Benzes or they give the fatawa of, of, the, of the dictator. But this sultan, he gave himself the title Anasir le Dinila. Anasir le Dinila. This is when we see the, system, the systematizing of the Fatua guilds, El Fatua being systematized. Right? And there's an occasion behind this systematizing. This was in the same period of when the Crusaders took over El Quds. So there was a problem. And our wise, pious predecessors, when things went bad, they weren't quick to just point the fingers at the other people. They understood that if we had a setback, it wasn't because the strength of the disbelievers, it was because of our internal weakness that we had to work on ourselves. Right? That's the real problem. There's always two adversaries, my brothers and sisters. There's the outward adversary and the inward adversary. And most times, the inward is more damaging than the outward, in most cases. So he systematized this. And there was five levels of the systematizing of the organized fatua to raise up males in the sacred manhood. After the government, by the way, of Anas ad these young men who went through the system these were the people who went back to, to El Quds, like with Salahuddin El Ayyubi, that got Jerusalem back. Now, and of course, we know that victory comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his divine decree. He, just, he uses, he uses people, right? So now, number one is the issue of the tarbiyah, of when young males are brought into a gathering with spiritual mentors, murshidin or shiyukh, not just in their households, but in an organized way, that they learn adab, and they seek to emulate the embodiment of noble character traits from their spiritual guides or from their teachers. This is number one. SubhanAllah, we have a crisis of adab in our community. Anytime you see young people addressing people who are as old as their parents or addressing mashayikh or female scholars, calling them by their first name, not even calling them brother or sister, you know it's a problem. I see this all the time. That's, a, that's, that's one small sign. Young men walking in front of their parents, walking in front of their fathers, without permission. It's bad at it. Abu Huraira, who actually corrected a, a, a young man from the Tabi'een doing this, is narrated in Al Adab al Mufrad by Imam Bukhari, Rahimullah Ta'ala. Right? It's bad at it. So, firstly, the first step is teaching adab. Teaching adab before ilm. The second is a ta'lim of teaching the deen to young men, which includes the formal teaching of, normal, uh, of noble traits of character, systematically. We have three sciences in Islam. And Sheikh Uthman Danfodio, Rahimullah Ta'ala, or Sheikh Uthman bin Fudi, also as he's known as the great uh, Fulani scholar, uh, in the 1800s, who established what's called the, the Khilafah Sokoto in northern Nigeria, in the Niger area. He wrote about this in regards to Hadith Jibril. In the Riwayah of Abu Huraira as Sahil al-Bukhari, that is Iman, Islam, and Isan. In this particular Hadith, Iman is mentioned first in the sequence. 
in the narration of Umar al-Khattab, Islam is mentioned first, then Iman, then Ihsan. El Iman, Sheikh Uthman bin Fudi said, represents basic aqidah. What one must believe to be a proper Muslim is in Iman. Then what is taught, El Islam represents the basics of fiqh ibadah, right? What one needs to know, and this relates into the five pillars. Buni Yosem al El Ihsan represents a tazkiyah, tazkiyah to nufus. The science is a spiritual purification. How to be able to look at bad traits of character, to empty them, to then with empty those bad traits of character, to try to instill good traits of character, to then be manifested. This would be called a tahliyah, wa tahliyah, wa tajliyah. Right, the nukda is, is the, uh, the the nukda is that's the, that's the secret. That's the the dot, right? The dot is above, the dot is removed, and the dot goes below, between the uh, between the ha, the ha, and the jim. So this is part of the ta'lim. Where are the spiritual diseases? And where are their remedies? Kibr is the most dangerous spiritual disease. There's, there's remedies. For every disease, there's a cure. Kibr is a dangerous disease. How do you spot it in yourself? What are the remedies? Al Hasid is a spiritual disease. How do you spot it? What are the remedies? Al Ujb, spiritual disease. This is the second step. Now, I'm saying this because these is a, we've been given a framework in our tradition of different stages of how we should systematize raising up males by a certain age to become young men. When these young males are below the age of seven, they're seven and below, is not really the primary thing to be trying to teach things that are scholastic in nature regarding Islam, right? This is more of the stage of, of stressing embodiment, to have them in the environment and to teach them certain things like adab. Then there's a, as a gradual raising up. This is the second step. So there's, there's the, the tarbiyah and teaching adab, and then there is the ta'lim. Then the third is taking this, what is being learned, and putting it through practice. And this is through al khidma, through service. Service to one's teachers. Of course, it would be service to one's parents. But service to the community. Community service. Organized community service. You know, there was a time in Baghdad, my brothers and sisters, where it was, it, it was so safe in Baghdad. And mind you, didn't have street lights everywhere. Where a Muslim sister could walk through the streets of Baghdad during the times of the Abbasian and could walk to the street from her family house or from a house to her house at dark by herself with no fear of being molested by a man. No fear of being robbed. The Fitian were doing neighborhood watch. This is a reality of, of, of Islamic civilizations. A lot of these things that we hear in society, these are things that are borrowed. The Boy Scouts, the Cub Scouts, Boy Scouts, and Eagle Scouts, there's a direct connection between how they borrowed this system from the Fatua Guilds. Europeans, Kamarum, had no idea a conception of chivalry until they learned this from Muslims. They had no such thing as a code of honor, or what they call the Knights of the Round Table, and the Templar Knights, and this code of honor. It didn't exist. They learned this from Muslims. Now, that's the third step. 
and there's benefit to this khidmah. Right? N number one, humility, tuadu, ascent. That's one, humility. Number two, to break just being self centered or selfish and only looking at one's needs. And then, th and then three, through the organized khidmah, helps with the akhuwa, to cultivating the brotherhood or the, or, or the feeling of fraternity, of brotherhood and sisterhood amongst the Muslims. Uh, this is the third step. These are subcategories within the Fatua guilds. So, we, so the fourth... The fourth step that we are talking about in this regard would be what we could say sunnah physical activities. Wrestling and martial arts, archery, equestrianism, horseback riding. These were all part of the, uh, of the Fatua guilds where the young men would learn self-defense. And this has practical application too. Number one, barakah. Anything the Prophet وسلم, did and encouraged the Sahaba to do, there's barakah in it. Jalahuddin Suyuti Rahimullah Ta'ala even wrote a short book about prophetic wrestling, about the ahadith that relate to wrestling and fighting amongst himself and his companions. So there's barakah. If the Prophet وسلم, did it and encouraged it, there's barakah in it, number one. There's a spiritual, this is metaphysical. The second is there is discipline that is taught in the wrestling and in the martial arts. There's a level of discipline that is cultivated in this regard. The third is physical fitness. Physical fitness is important. Remind, re remind you, our bodies are an amana from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Never fall into this language, my body, my choice. No, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala owns your body. It's all loaned to you. It's an amana. Lillahi ma fi samawati wal ard. In everything in the heavens and the earth, it belongs to Allah. Kul inna salati wa nusuki wa mahyaya wa mamati lillahi rabbil alameen. Say, my prayer, my sacrifice, my life, and my death, everything belongs to Allah. This is, this is, this is uh, an opinion. Yes, it's an opinion. But our bodies are in our manner, the Prophet ﷺ told us. Now we have, we've been given the agency to obey or disobey, but if we disobey and don't take care of this amana, there could be worldly punishment and punishment in the hereafter. But it isn't just your independent choice or my independent choice to do whatever I want to do with my body. My body, my choice. We need to cleanse this language out of our, these, these slogans based in kufr. We need to cleanse them out of our vocabulary that come from the so-called progressive left, to be more specific. And some of them come from the, the alt-right, too. Both of these are extremes, right? We shouldn't take either one of these political or social political platforms as naqida for us. That's, that's the point that I'm making. Now, this is the fourth point. And, and the other point with that is to have men who are able to defend their families and defend the ummah. I want to tell you something that, that, that was like a tipping point that I've told this story a number of times. I won't give, I'll give one example, not two. This really disturbed me. I had a brother that called me up. I'm not going to mention his national origin. <clears throat> not, not important. He called me, and he claimed that someone who I know left a message in his wife's um, inbox on Facebook that troubled his wife, and his wife felt a little intimidated. Like, the, the, the accusation wasn't that he was flirting or trying to come on to his wife, that he made a statement to his wife that his wife felt threatened by or intimidated. So he called me. So I said, 
brother, do you know the brother? He's like, yeah. I said, well, did you write him? No. I said, did you call him? He said, no. I said, brother, whatever you do, don't tell your wife you called me first. She's going to lose respect for you. Where's the gheira at for your wife? Why are you coming to me when, when, when you feel like somebody intimidated your wife and you don't have the gheira and, t- and the tenacity to stand up for your wife's honor if she felt? I said, okay, brother. I said, do you have a screenshot of what he said? He said, well, no, I don't have a screenshot. You know, we deleted it. I said, brother, I said, I'm Walikum. I hung the phone up. That is not manly. I'll give you another story. Because this all is how we saw this as a crisis. Sister contacts me, no need me mentioning uh, where, where they're immigrants from. Sister calls me up and says, Sheikh, I, said, I got a problem I don't know what to do. I said, I'm, I'm, I'm having doubts in my marriage. I said, what's wrong, sister? She said, you know, uh, we heard a noise at night and we woke up in the bedroom. And my husband said, did you hear that? And I said, yeah. And then the husband told the wife, oh, why don't you go downstairs and check that out? That's not manhood. That's just a dhakr. That's not a rajul. Not a rajul. A man in Islam should be willing to put his physical safety in jeopardy, even if it means injury or death to protect his family. This is, yeah, and yeah, exactly. And he would be rewarded, he would be rewarded, he would be counted as a shaheed if he defends his household and defends his wife. He'd be with, he'd be with, with Hamza, right? But this, this is where we're at. That's the fourth stage. Then the fifth is, the skilled trades, or we can say the artisanship section, or some may call this industrial education, mean that the young men were taught a craft so that they could help the community, and also when they come back from Ribat, that they are able to do something to make a living to get a wife. Because at that time, before cars, you need someone who knows about being a blacksmith or using iron to make the shoes for the horse to go out in Ghazwa. Someone has to make the horseshoes. Someone has to know how to make the swords. Someone has to know how to make the arrows. Someone has to know how to make the, uh, uh, um, the jewelry or like the, 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 the rings. Someone has to know how to hunt and get some food. Right? No halal meat market, no grocery store, no refrigerators to keep your meat. Right? So they were trained how to do those things so that they could help the Muslims going out on Ghazwa or, or going to, to Ribat. Ribat, when I say Ribat, this means that in the area like the town of the Abbasiyin, you'd have the cities and then you'd have a fortress that's out into the countryside in which people would stand guard that they could send word back if they were crusaders or invaders, you know, the crusaders or the Mongols, coming into the lands of the Muslims. There were people who were on guard, and they would be the first line of defense, right? So you need people for these things, skilled trade, right? And in this, this breeds a level of healthy, manly self-esteem. When you're a man, you're able to do something with your hands and build something. This, breed, this, this brings a type of healthy self-esteem into a man. Right? Now, 
These are the five aspects of the Fatua guilds. And I suggest that it can be customized for each area, each locality. But when we look at our youth programming and how we are raising up our young males to be men, that we have these types of aspects. And likewise, there should be something developed on a different scale for our young ladies to know about sacred womanhood. But I'm not here to talk about womanhood. I'm here to talk about manhood, right? We'll let one of the sisters who's a scholar write about that and investigate that, right? Starting off with, with, with Fatima bint Muhammad and, 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 and Aisha bint Abi Bakr and you can investigate that, right? Now, how much more time, uh, uh, Sheikh, uh, Sheikh Muhammad, how much time do I have left? Seven minutes, okay, I'll wrap up. So there's, I'll, I'll touch on two things before Q&A. Firstly, the first trait of character to be instilled, the most important virtue Everything starts with a sidq, with truthfulness. Sidq is the foundation. Truthfulness and cleanliness in intention, truthfulness in speech, truthfulness in action, and truthfulness going back to that intention of being firm and holding on to that in the face of opposition or difficulty. Sitqaniya, wa sitqa qawl, wa sitqa amal, wa sitqa azm. These are essential. What is the proof for this? A vigorously authenticated hadith. Qal al Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam wa sallam, in a sitqa yahdi ila bir, when a birri yahdi ila jannah. A sidq leads to al-bir. Al-bir is uh, kalima jami'ah in Arabic. It's not a term that can be translated in one word. It's a comprehensive term. The noble traits of character is more than just piety. It's like a conglomeration of noble traits of character. And then these noble traits of character, when they're manifested, guides one or leads one to paradise. But without a sit, without truthfulness and intention, speech and action, then all other traits of character, maqadamu akhlaq, will be deficient. And there's no such thing as a white lie. Let me stop that. This is, this is a big lie. It is a white lie. No, it's not a white lie. No, a lie is a lie. Deception is a deception. And also, in the sikhun amal, this relates also to us keeping our word with our actions as it relates to our time. Stop this stuff about CPT, as colored people time, African time, Daisy time, out of time. We should be a people that when we set a time to do something, we should never have the intention of being habitually late. We should be on time. Because that is, that is a sign of our truthfulness. But then we'll go up, we'll go to work on time, why? Because we value that paycheck more than we value the commitments with each other. So when it goes to working for Mr. Bernstein or at this corporation or whoever to get a dollar, we'll be on time for that job. When it comes to us, oh. and time is the most valuable commodity we have in this dunya because you can lose money and get it back. You can lose property and get it back. Your health can go down and be sick and you can recover your health. When time is gone, you cannot get time back. That's it, it's gone. Time is gone, time is precious. And we only have a little bit. And we don't know how much we have. Medical milk could come at any moment. We don't know. Most precious commodity in this dunya for us is time. Now, The manifestation, and there's more noble traits of character, of course. 
the fullness of the manifestation of this is called El Ithar. This is known as altruism in the English language, honorific altruism. That it is, and this is what makes up chivalry, that you prefer others over yourself. That you are willing to give others your hukuk, yet willing to forego your rights. You extend and give people their rights, and you fulfill your responsibilities, but you are willing to forego your rights. Right? You give more. El Ithar is giving and preferring others with your time, wealth, and self. Ithar is preferring others over yourself with your time, your wealth, and yourself. This is Ithar. We'll end with a quick story. Ibn Qayyim narrates this. It's by Jafar ibn Muhammad as Sadiq. With long light to Ali. Uh, Jafar as Sadiq is one of the teachers of Imam Malik, and one of the teachers of uh, Imam al Adam, uh, Imam al Adam uh, Abu Hanifa. Rahmatullah Ali. He's with one of his um, students, a young man he was raising up. In other books, his name is known as Shaqiq al Bawkhi. Bawkh is in Afghanistan today. Bawkh. Shaqiq al Bawkhi. As the story goes, Imam Jafar al Sadiq asked Shaqiq, What is Fatuwa? Right? Shaqiq said, He said, When I am given, I show shukr, I show thanks. And when I am denied, I show sabr, I show patient, patient, patient perseverance. Imam Jafar al said, even the dogs in Medina do that. Now, shukr is good. It's a good trait. Sabr is good. But this is a maqam that's higher than that. Because we have different darajat. Right? So it's a good thing. So he says, what is fatua with you? And this is plural, meaning the household and descendants of the Prophet Muhammad alayhi salam. What is al fatua with Ahlul Bayt? This was the question. What's the fatua with you all? What's fatua? What's the chivalry with you all? Imam Jafar al-Sadiq said, when we are given, we do ithar, we give it away. We prefer others over ourselves. And when we are denied and not given, we show thanks. We show shukr. That's ithar. That's, that's part of the spiritual reality of ithar. Like how Sahaba did, like Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl did at, at the Battle of Yarmouk. There's a famous story. The companions practiced this and they preferred others over themselves. Like Ali ibn Abi Talib did when he laid in the bed so that the Prophet وسلم, Abu Bakr Siddiq could escape Mecca and go to Medina. He was willing to lay in the bed and take the swords so that the Prophet وسلم, and Abu Bakr Siddiq could get away free. He preferred them over himself, willing to give his life. These are the honorable companions and our role models. As a matter of fact, these are superheroes. You don't, the young, you don't need Thor. You don't need Spider-Man. You have Ali ibn Abi Talib. You have Ikrima ibn Abi Jahl. You have Umar ibn Khattab. You have, you, have, you, have some, you have some real some real men, not fantasy. Some real men. With that, my brothers and sisters of Islam, I will close with my, with my talk. I think we have about 15 more minutes before the event. We will have the books for sale uh, Salat al-Isha, inshallah, uh, out in the hallway, as well as another book that I wrote called Blackness in Islam uh, about the, um, the uh, Sahaba who were from the Ahbash and also some of the other 
black companions because they were more than just Bilal. <laughs> there were many more than Bilal, right, that people don't know about. So uh, with that, I will uh, take the first question. Uh, yes, uh, brother. Wa alaykum salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Right. 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 Okay, so there's there's two things. We don't have a lot of time, so we can get some other questions. So two things, and I'll try to keep my answers as brief as possible. Number one, parents have to be parents. Parents have to be the authority in the house. I strongly discourage parents from letting, for giving their little kids these, these shiatin right here. You give your, you give your eight-year-old, ten-year-old kid one of these so-called smartphones to distract them while you do other things, and you literally are letting them look at the world and every munkar that's out there. You've given them access unabated. Even if you try to put on some sort of locks on the phone, they know how to get around that. They figure out how to get around it real quickly, right? So that's one thing. Like, we have to be able to regulate the access of what our young people are getting to. I don't think that any young person in our community even needs a phone and to, at the youngest 15. And then maybe that's even too young. We don't need these phones. Right? And then when you give them a phone, they're able to drive. You can put an app device on it. You can actually follow them or track them and know actually where they're at location finder. Right? Well, parents have to be parents, but I know one thing. I couldn't do anything I wanted to do with my mom and dad. <laughs> I couldn't do anything I wanted to do. I know it was a different time. Like, I was a kid, you know, in the 80s, but at the same time, I couldn't just do whatever I wanted to do. Like, late 80s, I couldn't do whatever I wanted to do. There were consequences. And I just want consequences from the parents. It was the community. See, in African-American culture, we call it a whooping. Every elder in the community had permission to give me a whooping or to discipline me. And if one of my parents found out, I would get a double whooping. Right? So it should be, I'm, I'm not saying that you, that you take out the belt and whip your children. But what I'm saying is that it takes a village to raise children to be healthy men. Right? It just can't be a family-only endeavor. This is what I'm getting at, right? The second point is, is that this, that, okay, the paint that Islam is more than just his Quran. And his Quran is very important. Or being at a dars, right? And this is where the sunnah sports are important and the activities. What we do is we have a couple of camps during the summertime. We take the young men out camping and fishing. Then we have something in the winter time because we have archery classes every day on Saturday. When deer hunting season comes in for bow and arrow before a gun, Sheikh Abdul Karim Yahya takes the young men out for deer hunting. And how good it is for them that they, they, that they kill the deer and slaughter it properly, bring it back home, and then for the gathering, the young men eat the stew made from the deer that they hunted. That's fun stuff. You go out swimming, learn some jujitsu, go fishing, go hunting. Alhamdulillah. I like that type of stuff when I was when I was a young man. Would you think that's cool to go out and do that? You see? Yeah. So alhamdulillah. Yeah. You got a question? Yeah. Bismillah.
Okay, so we as parents, we have to vet things. But as I mentioned, tachlia uh, and uh, tachlia, in order for us to give some sort of satisfaction to our children, we have to offer an alternative. So you just can't take, 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 take. You have to be able to give something and give an alternative and just saying everything is haram. Everything is haram. No, no, no. If you take something, you have to give an alternative and give something that's positive and that's good and that's wholesome to take the place of that thing, right? So it just can't be an issue that we block everything from Muslim children and then people think, oh, that you can't be a Muslim and have any fun. That can't be the case. We have to be able to come up and, and that requires parents doing research. And like for my... Uh, my young guys, well, now they're not young anymore. My eldest son is 20, and my other son is 18 now. But I was with talking with other parents who are Muslims around the same age as my children, and I was getting ideas from different fathers and then trying to bring them together to do group, to do group activities. So I was trying to figure out about what different games and different activities they could do. But that takes some research, and it takes some effort. Right, and, and, and Allah knows best. Uh, we, have, we have time for two more. Uh, if sisters want to ask a question, you can. I, I can uh, answer questions. Are there any mothers up there that have any questions? Uh, yes, yes, Ahi. Yep. How how do we make that aspect of like the time like look like in a reasonable way? Like, what does that consist of? Okay, so in in all openness, that fifth step of the artisans we haven't implemented yet of the artisanship and teaching skill trades. We have not done that yet. What we did was we had the 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 halqa on Wednesday, and we start off reading. Uh, through a book, a traditional uh, makra'a, like we were reading Kitab al Futua, uh, Basulami, in Arabic, translated into English, then given commentary. And even we were talking about the, there's some ahadith in there that are, that are uh, weak. So we were going through explaining, okay, well, this hadith is da'if jiddan or whatever, right? Okay. Then what we had, what we have uh, is a, community gathering on Thursday evening for Sirah. To learn the Sirah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Friday, Yom al is a day off. Saturday, physical activity, and then 11 o'clock archery class. Right? Sunday and Tuesday, Jiu-Jitsu. <coughs> now, COVID-19 came and put all that to a stop. And then we were still doing the halqa like via Zoom. And then we've slowly brought things back. So on Saturday, there is the archery. Um, we have not gotten fully back into the Jiu-Jitsu with Sifu Jabbar because we have couple of brothers that are martial arts experts. Um, we have the, 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 the halqa. And then we also have, at various times, um, on weekends, organize community service activities. So we have a group of elderly sisters who maybe husbands have died or single mothers. We have a list. 
and we will send the Yum brothers over to shovel snow during the winter time. We have a list, and we go down the list about whose snow needs to be shoveled. This part of like Khidma. Uh, we drop off food boxes to some of like the people in our community that are poor. Because Detroit is America's poorest major city. Like Detroit is a is a poor city, right? So there's different community service activities that we do, uh, community cleanup, different things that we do, in which we, uh, at certain times, we organize those. Uh, alhamdulillah. So that's the way that we have it looking. But we don't do anything on Yom uh, Jum'ah. And uh, normally on Monday, we don't do anything. And of course, all of the young men aren't there for every single activity, right? But there's a core group. And like anything, there's a saying, the cream rises to the top. You're going to have young males that excel others in different things than others. And some of them will find certain things more enjoyable than others. But the importance is, is to keep them in the Islamic environment and for to cultivate the, the akhua. Because in this group, we have African-American young males. We have Yemeni young males, or the parents come from Yemen. Parents who come from, from Syria. We have young people whose parents come from Bangladesh from India, from Pakistan, right? So uh, from Nigeria. So all these different Muslims from different backgrounds come together and wrestle and do jujitsu and they sit together and learn and they eat food together. And these are relationships, inshallah, that we hope that extend themselves when they get older and also will cut down on some of the ta'aslub, some of the aslabiyah and some of the the, uh, the unsuriya that we have amongst ourselves. We have racism amongst us as Muslims, we want to be honest. It exists in some pockets of our community, right? So there's so, there's so much benefit from these gatherings, alhamdulillah. And these young brothers, inshallah, these young brothers, some of them maybe will go and become talabu ilm, and they'll be maybe the future mashayikh. Maybe some of them will be the board presidents of the, uh, of the masjid, you know, the masajid, right? So uh, th this is our hope that we are working to cultivate and also I have daughters and also inshallah that these are be some honorable young men who are fit to marry my daughters right so even I had some skin in the game as Imam Zaid says I had some skin in the game I want a nice real man to marry my daughter I don't want a bump to go off in the night and some guy tells my daughter to go and check out the bump and go downstairs to protect her husband like I don't want that I don't want that Right. Anyway, khair inshallah, we ran out of time. Uh, anything that I've said that has been a benefit that is from the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, anything that I've said that is incorrect, that comes solely from me. And I ask Allah's forgiveness and your forgiveness. And I ask Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make us to be amongst the Saudi king. I ask Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make our young males grow up to be chivalrous men that are fit to marry our daughters. I ask Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect this community. I ask Almighty Allah azza wa jal make the Muslims be a beacon of light to restore sacred manhood and sacred womanhood back into the United States of America. Subhanakallahumma bihamdik nashiru an la ilaha ant nasaghfiruka wa natubu ilayk. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Wal-asri inna al-insana lafi khusr. Illa ladhina amanu wa amlu salihati wa tawasu bilhaq. وتواصل بالصبر وأفهم منكم السلام عليكم